The narrow and limited confines of the Victorian world could not hold the complexities of Mary Todd Lincoln. In a time when a woman's success was determined by marriage and motherhood, Mrs. Lincoln was considered an equal in the company of well-educated men. She was comfortable discussing politics, addressing the troops, entertaining foreign diplomats, or representing her husband on diplomatic missions. Her outspokenness and ambition made her an unconventional woman, a woman ahead of her time and one much misunderstood. Her attitude in life was, and I quote, what is to be is to be, and nothing we can say or do can divert an inexorable fate. But in spite of knowing this, one feels better even after losing if one has had a brave, wholehearted fight to get the better of destiny. We now join Sally Mummy as Mary Todd Lincoln in 1864. Ever since I was a young girl in Lexington, Kentucky, I had always wanted to be First Lady. Our neighbor, Henry Clay, the handsomest man in all of the county, second only to my father, ran for president. He told me one day, Miss Molly, Molly's my nickname, Miss Molly, when I run for president, you can come and stay with me in the White House whenever you wish. Mr. Clay was not elected. However, from that point forward, I determined that the man I married would be president and I would be first lady. Growing up, I was always fascinated with politics and I became very fluent in the language, if you will. Uh, I was courted by two men who would be presidential candidates, Stephen Douglas, a very polished and um, elegant man, if somewhat short, the very man that my family wanted me to marry, and Abraham Lincoln, a raw, unpolished, if you will, a country lawyer. Against my family's wishes, I chose Mr. Lincoln, and I started the very unenviable task of uh, teaching him um, the social graces, if you will, the courtesies, and trying to tame his wild Republican hair. In fact, I was the first one that told Mr. Lincoln that he would be president. In the evening of his election, I had fallen asleep. It was around midnight, and suddenly I was awoken by the shouts of crowds, and my husband came running into the house and said, Mary, Mary, we are elected. He did not say, I am elected. He said, we are elected. What a wise man. By saying that, he showed that our marriage was an equal partnership, as would the elected office. Think of it. My dreams had come true. I would be first lady of these United States. We were in Philadelphia uh, en route to Washington when we heard the rebels had inaugurated Jefferson Davis as their president, but we still felt that the war could be diverted. We wouldn't need to have this war. In fact, in my husband's inaugural address, he said, we will not be the aggressor. When the rebels fired on Fort Sumter, my husband called for 75 thousand volunteers. The men were filled with paper, patriotic fervor, and they ran and signed up to defend this union. Oh, how we cheered as those soldiers marched by on Pennsylvania Avenue. They were so handsome and smart. But I kept on thinking of you ladies at home. It was the women at home they had to carry on without the support of their men. Now, early in my marriage, uh, Mr. Lincoln would have to travel um, the circuit as a lawyer, so I knew very well what it was like to be a lady in the house alone. 
you have to have the same type of courage each and every day that those soldiers do. You have to get up, even if you're exhausted, and tend your family. Up until now, your sphere of influence has been the home and your children. The war has changed that. Now, you ladies are out plowing the fields, planting the crops, and harvesting them. Those delicate fingers that those soldiers are dreaming about are working in munitions factories. They're working in mills 14 hours a day, six days a week, to support the uh, troops and what they need. After the first battle in the Civil War, it was obvious that nurses were desperately needed. Many of them, thousands of women with the same patriotic fervor as your men, stepped forward and volunteered. Some took the injured into their home to tend them. Others became government nurses. Still others chose to be nurses in the battlefield, just outside in the tents. I spoke to one, uh, they call them field nurses, I spoke to one nurse who said as she was passing a drink of water to a soldier, a bullet ripped through her sleeve. On another time, she held a soldier in her arms and a sniper's bullet smashed into him. Three or four times a week, I will go to area hospitals as um, Mr. Lincoln's schedule permits, he will join me. Each government nurse is assigned to 125 patients. These ladies need as much help as they can get. Of course, um, the, the presence of a lady is so calming on the soldiers, and frequently I'll bring fruits and writing materials or, or anything to cheer them up. Frequently, I will um, write letters for men who are innocent of the alphabet or who too are too, too weak to write or read to them or just talk. There was one soldier I met. He was shot through the lung, his blood soaking his treasured Bible. Another soldier came and washed it off in the stream and gave it back to him. I read verses from that very Bible to that soldier just yesterday. Sometimes you are the last human contact with a soldier before he passes. There was one young man I was visiting and he said, Mother? Mother? I held on to his hand and said, Yes, son, I am here. With that, he smiled and breathed his last. You women are in the home front. You are your efforts to support the Sanitation Commission and Christian Commission is enormous. In fact, you're an army of nurses taking care to supply whatever you can to the soldiers on the front. You might sew shirts or knit socks or make quilts or do any sort of bedding that might be needed. You can bake or cook. In fact, you have also been very successful at raising much needed money. A lot of the uh, women, once they make something, will put a little note on it to send it to the soldiers just to cheer them, to let them know someone was thinking of them. Correspondences, friendships, and even marriages have sprung up. In fact, I did see <laughs> This one uh, note from a girl who wrote, and, and I'll quote, um, Dear soldier, I have knit these socks for you. Do you like them? I'm 19 years old. I have blonde hair and blue eyes. I hope that you will write to tell me about yourself. <laughs> Desiree Burns, Groveton, New Hampshire. P.S. If you are married, please pass these on to a soldier who is not so fortunate. Do you believe in love at first sight? Well, it certainly was not that when I met Mr. Lincoln. 
we met at a dance at my sister's house uh, in Springfield, Illinois. My sister had married the son of the governor of Illinois. <laughs> well done, Elizabeth. <laughs> I was in a pink, I favorite color pink, I was in a pink dancing gowns with matching pink slippers. I was the belle of the ball, if I say so myself. Suddenly this man came and his frame filled the whole doorway. He walked up to me and said, Miss Todd, I would like to dance with you in the worst way. And he did. He was the worst dancer I had ever been with. Of course, it didn't help that he wore his size 13 Conestoga boots to the dance rather than dancing slippers. But he had the kindest eyes I had ever seen. I noticed that um, he was shy around the ladies, but he and I spoke the same language politics. He asked to call the next day, and he did. And my family was, of course, welcoming to him until they discovered that he was courting me in earnest. And then there was a definite chill to him. He was unsuitable in their eyes, and that was it. Well, we eventually became engaged. As all couples have their ups and downs, we did too. And in fact, our engagement was broken. Months later, we were brought together by uh, neighbors at a dinner. Neither one of us knew the other would be present. And from that point on, we were inseparable and decided to marry. In fact, <laughs> Mr. Lincoln went to the minister and said in his elegant words, Reverend, we want to get hitched tonight. Well, <laughs> nine months later, I gave birth to the first of four sons. I was not supported by my family in any way, and I did not ask for any help. I'm an outspoken woman, and I make no apologies for it. Unfortunately, I have made political enemies by being so blunt. In fact, the vampire press writes such falsehoods about me. They are doing that, attacking me in an effort to discredit my husband, but I know Mr. Lincoln is the only man that can hold this country together as others are so desperately trying to tear it apart. I want to tell you soldiers that this country owes a great debt of gratitude for you. Some of you has sacrificed even with your lives, but the ladies also need to have recognition for all their sacrifices and the support they gave to the troops. Without their much needed effort, our soldiers would have suffered far greater. Some of you may not be aware that my husband uh, piloted a flatboat on the treacherous Mississippi. Those same strong hands of his are on the wheel of this great nation. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Lincoln will pilot our country through its difficulties into safe harbor and peace once more. May God bless our union. What is your definition of a memorable woman? Some we remember because of their daring or their leadership. Kate Carney finds quiet courage against huge odds memorable. She's the writer and presenter of six Heroic Women Talk Living History programs about uncommon women who lived when women had few legal rights and were owned by their husbands. You know about the Lowell Mill girls, but do you know of their boarding housekeepers? Mrs. Larkham is a house mother who watched over 30 girls. It's 1843. Accidents are happening. The mills are cutting wages. The mill girls are astir. Some of them are protesting. Mrs. Larkham feels she dare not protest, and besides, she needs her job. Her quandary is as spellbinding as today's headlines.
I understand that you are interested in the Lowell Mill girls. Well, I can certainly understand why, because these Yankee girls are doing something that no other group of young ladies has ever done before. They are earning their own money, and they are still respectable. Well, you see, that's because everybody knows that they have to live in our boarding houses, and our boarding houses have very strict rules, and so they know that the girls are still good girls. And, you know, that's the promise of Lowell, that there is good money to be earned and still respectability. Of course, the funny thing is, when the girls were started earning their own money, they found out that there was um, more worth to them than they had known about before. And the mills didn't expect that, these girls thinking for themselves, but you see, they are quite intelligent. And when they came here, they could read and write. And of course, they're very refined, except of course, when you go to, if you're here around noontime dinner bell, because when that bell rings, those girls come charging up the street and they pour in through the door and they attack the food like farmers after a hard day in the fields. And they can put away a stuffed chicken, boiled potato, and a green bean dinner in minutes, talking the whole time with their mouths full. And then the back-to-work bell rings before they have finished, and they shove another forkful in their mouths, and they start out for the door, chewing as they go. And one day, the noise, I said, girls, manners, please. And just then, the back-to-work bell rang, and they started for the door, and one girl said, we don't have time for manners. And of course, they don't. But when and if they do, they will learn fast. Now, when I first came here, my friend Mrs. Abbott showed me around. Well, we're friends, but we don't always agree. And uh, there was a little girl, an eight-year-old, named Harriet Hansen, tagging along. And Mrs. Abbott showed me the first of the bedrooms, and that girl, that little girl, just piped right up and she said, look at how they got to three double beds into a room that's built for two. And besides that, there's the washstand and the nightstands and the chest of drawers and the trunks and hats, boxes and band boxes and dresses of the six girls. It's a wonder the six girls can fit in at all. Ha, said Mrs. Habit. Oh, well, no, everybody fits if nobody breathes. Of course, you might not want to breathe, though, because, well, we seal the windows shut from September to May to save on coal, don't you know? And so when the girls, uh, well, there's a lot of girls, they just don't wash so well as you'd like, especially in winter, because, you know, they'd have to break the ice in order to get to some water. So I guess you'd say that we just don't wash winters. <laughs> And of course, little Harriet, now she's 16, but she'll say anything too. We were talking the other day about the turnouts. Oh, you know what that is? Well, that's the uh, ladylike term for strikes. And she said, oh, I was so excited when they had that second turnout because I was working with the spinners as a bobbin girl, and they were going to march, and I wanted to march with them. I was so excited. But then the day of the turnout came out, and there were the girls outside, the weavers from the other floor, lining all up to march, and the spinners on my floor were not doing a thing but arguing. And I thought, oh no, they're not going to not go after all that talk. And I got a little mad, and I said, well, I don't care what you do, but I'm going to run, I'm going to walk and march on the turnout whether you do or not. And I turned and I headed right straight for those big double doors. And when I got there, I turned around and looked, and there were all these older girls right behind me. It looked to all the world like I was leading them, a little child. I was 11. <laughs> Oh, and there was, oh, there was maybe 2,000 girls marching through the streets of Lowell that day.
and they were carrying banners and singing songs, old songs, new words. Oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent into a factory to pine away and die? Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave, for I'm so fond of liberty. I cannot be a slave. Oh, it was so exciting. Yes, Harriet, it was, but nothing came of it. And now they are calling Lowell the cradle of the American Industrial Revolution. Ha! said Mrs. Abbott. Well, there's another revolution coming, maybe, that they have to watch out for. Because one these days, one of these, some of these girls are they're gonna all get together and speak as one. And there is going to be plenty of revolution right there. And some good for females might come out of Lowell after all. Libby Frank of Framingham is commissioned by the Framingham History Center to bring to life local women of the past. She portrays a librarian at the Edgell Memorial Library in 1885, the superintendent of the Women's Reformatory in 1949, and a Framingham Center businesswoman who was thrown in the Charles Street Jail for picketing for suffrage in 1920. When the recent celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War was being planned, it was suggested that she look into the life of poet and reformer Julia Ward Howe. Julia's long life was played out in New York, Boston, and Newport. She was at the heart of the artistic and political scene during the three decades before the Civil War. Julia's Battle Hymn of the Republic was first sung in 1862 in a Framingham church, and now, here she is. I am Julia Ward Howe. Every part of my name is a story. Julia. I was named for my mother, Julia Cutler of Jamaica Plain. She too was a published poet. And my sister, Julia. She died at the age of three, two weeks before I was born in 1819. She was the first little Julia. She was good. I was not. I have red hair. Ward. My father was Samuel Ward, a successful New York banker. And he kept us in, in a series of luxurious mansions in isolation away from society. And there I stayed with only my three brothers and two sisters as playfellows and my books and my music. And how? <laughs> My husband was Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, the director of the Perkins Institute for the Blind. Oh, he became very famous when Charles Dickens wrote about his great success with the little deaf blind girl, Laura Bridgman. And when he was very young, he went to Greece to fight in the War of Independence. He was following his idol, Lord Byron. We still have Lord Byron's helmet in our home. The Greek government gave him the title Chevalier, or we called him Chev for short. The first time I saw him, it was out the window of the Perkins Institute. He was galloping across a field on a black horse. So, you see, I have been surrounded by more Samuels than the Old Testament. <laughs> my father was Samuel Ward. My older brother was Sam Ward, Jr. My husband is Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, and, and my youngest, my little boy, is also Samuel, Jr. <laughs> I remember a trip I went on with my mother when I was, I must have been about three years old, and she took me to upstate New York. I was going to meet an Indian chief, Chief Red Jacket. And my mother gave me a twist of tobacco tied with a blue ribbon, which I was to give to the Indian chief. And she said, now, be sure to notice the silver medal about his neck. It was given to him by General George Washington. Well, I did the wrong thing. <laughs> when I saw Chief Red Jacket, I threw my arms around his neck. He was not pleased. Neither was my mother. 
My mother died when I was five. My brother Sam was 10. My brother Henry was six. Marion was four. My sister Louisa was two. And little Annie had just been born. My father was so sad. He moved us out of the beautiful mansion on Bowling Green with, with the furniture still in the packing crates. And we moved into a new mansion on Bond Street. I remember shelves and shelves of books. Now, when I first learned to read, the first book I remember was called The Iroquois Bride. And I thought it would make a lovely play, so I invited the family as the audience. And I, of course, got to be the Iroquois Bride. And, and my little brother, Marion, was my lover. And we climbed on a footstool and stabbed each other to death. Well, the adults were shocked. The book was taken away from me. My three brothers were sent off to boarding school. I was always addressed as Miss Ward by the servants since I was the oldest daughter. And there I was, alone with my books and my music and my study of foreign languages. But then my brother Sam became engaged to Emily Astor the granddaughter of John Jacob Astor, the richest man in all of New York City. You know, what a plethora of parties surrounded their engagement and their wedding. At last, my dancing lessons were put to good use. And at their wedding, I was the first bridesmaid. But then, the angel of death stopped my family. My my father died in 1839 following the stock market crash. And my brother Henry died of typhoid fever in my arms. And Sam's wife, Emily, she died in childbirth. The only thing that could ease my sorrow was writing poetry. Uh, then I, I went to Boston to, to visit with a, a girl who had been engaged to my late brother, and it was she along with Longfellow and Charles Sumner, who introduced me to Chev. <laughs> we always called him Chev. <laughs> it was a tempestuous relationship. <sighs> At my wedding, I was granted the right to keep my own name. I would be known as Mrs. Julia Ward Howe, not Mrs. Samuel Gridley Howe. But that was all of myself that was left to me. We returned after a year's time, a, a honeymoon in Europe. And, and we came back to Boston with our firstborn, a little girl named Julia Romana, since she'd been born in the Eternal City. And then, then I had to live at the Perkins Institute in South Boston. It, it was far, far away from Boston proper, and, and the omnibus to take you there only came once every two hours. So the first thing I did was I had another baby, a little girl we called Florence after her godmother, Florence Nightingale. I was a terrible cook and housekeeper. And Chef always wanted me to cook elaborate dinners for his friends. My father had always told me, Julia, you should work on your cooking. But no, I would rather study German. <laughs> my only music was singing songs to my babies. I, I wanted to write poetry. But instead, I had two more babies, a son named Henry and, and a little girl named Laura. Named after the little deaf-blind girl, Laura Bridgman. But then I got a holiday. I went to Rome for nine months. Chev sailed back to Boston, and I stayed there with my sister and my two youngest babies. Ah, Rome. I knew a day of glad surprise in Rome, free to the childish joy of wandering, I strayed, amassing wildflowers, ivy leaves, thoughts of unending beauty from the fields. But then I had to go back to Boston, to my cross-husband and all my children and my cares. But I did manage to write some poetry. 
And all the while I was helping Chef edit an abolition newspaper. And then I had my poems published. The book was called Passion Flowers. Oh, Chef was furious. A woman should only live for her husband and her children. Her voice should not be heard in the wide world. But then the politics of slavery dominated our lives. He'd been an abolitionist for decades, and now I was one, too. He said to me, the radical John Brown will pay a visit to you this afternoon. You will receive him. So that afternoon, the, the bell rang at, at our place in, in, in South Boston, and there was a middle-aged man, a middle-sized, with amber hair and, and beard streaked with gray, and I said, I'm very glad to meet you. My husband has spoken so very highly of you. And some time later, I was the one who noticed in the paper the news of the attack on Harper's Ferry. I pointed it out to Chef, and he said, ah, Brown has gotten to work. And then when Brown was hanged, the bells of Boston rang out in lamentation. And when war broke out in 1862, Chev was appointed the head of the Sanitary Commission, and he made many trips to Washington to, to inspect the troops. And I went with him on November of 1861. And after inspecting the troops, I accepted the challenge of Reverend James Freeman Clark to write new words to the tune of John Brown's body. I went to sleep in the Willard Hotel, and I awakened in the gray light of early dawn. And as I lay there, words began forming in my mind. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, line after line, verse after verse, until it was all done. I found some paper and a, and a pen, and I wrote down the words and went back to sleep. When I awakened, I remembered what had happened, but I couldn't remember the words. But I looked down, and there they were. I thought, I like this better than anything else I have ever written. I sent it to the Atlantic Monthly, and it was published in February 1862 the battle hymn of the Republic. At last, I had found a way to serve the Union cause. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching Deborah Ann Goss has sung since 1994 with Annabelle Gretz as the proper ladies, bringing 19th century American history to life through music. Popular songs are a wonderful window for looking into the social movements of America's past, and Deborah gives us an example today. From one of her solo programs of anti-slavery music, she performs here in the first person as abolitionist, suffragist, and singer, Abby Hutchinson Patton, who you could say was a superstar when singing songs of social justice with her brothers in the 1840s. Abby was a sweet, honest teenage girl who left the stage at age 19 to become a wife. But she always enjoyed performing and came back on very special occasions. So here, singing and explaining some of Sweet Freedom's songs is Deborah Ann Goss as Abby Hutchinson Patton. 
Let music swell the breeze and sing from all the trees sweet freedom's song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathes partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. That is my favorite verse of a song I think you all probably know quite well. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. When that song was first sung at the Park Street Church in Boston, Massachusetts, on the 4th of July in 1831, I was two years old, and there were two million slaves in this land of liberty. Two million slaves. Well, now that didn't set right with us Hutchinsons up in Milford, New Hampshire. And a decade later, uh, some of us who'd been singing of, of the uh, pleasures of home life and uh, peace and justice for all, it began singing in earnest for temperance and women's rights, and particularly for the abolition of slavery. And there were some very important songs being written, like, uh, like this one. Sadly, the fugitive weeps in his cell, Listen a while to the story we tell. Listen, ye gentle ones, listen, ye brave. Lady fair, lady fair, weep for the slave. Lady fair, lady fair, weep for the slave. Praying for liberty dearer than life, Torn from his little one, torn from his wife. Flying from slavery, hear him and save. Christian men, Christian men, help the poor slave. Christian men, Christian men, help the poor slave. Think of his agony, feel for his pain. Should his heart master e'er hold him again? Spirit of liberty, rise from your grave. Make him free, make him free, rescue the slave. Make him free, make him free, rescue the slave. Freely the slave master goes where he will. Free men stand ready, his wishes to fulfill. Helping the tyrant, or honest, or knave. Thinking not, caring not, for the poor slave, thinking not, caring not, for the poor slave. Talk not of liberty, liberty is dead. See the slave masters whip over our head. Stooping beneath it, we ask what he craves. Boston boys, Boston boys, catch me, my slaves. Boston boys, Boston boys, catch me, my slaves. Free men, arouse ye before it's too late. Slavery is knocking at every gate. Make good the promise your early days gave. Boston boys, Boston boys, rescue the slave. Boston boys, Boston boys, rescue the slave. That's how it went, and 
that slave was rescued. The man's name was George Latimer. How can I forget? Those words uh, got us enough money, got enough money to buy his freedom from the Leverett Jail in 1842. He moved to Lynn, Massachusetts. He raised a family, and he lived near my brothers, who settled also in Lynn. Now, the next year, my brother, Jesse, wrote his famous abolition song, Get Off the Track. It was, um, it was written for the Liberty Party, but uh, with some changes over the years, depending on the political circumstances, it was sung for the next 20 years. I'm going to uh, sing just a few verses of it so you'll get the idea. And if you should happen to have the inclination to sing along, I hope you will. <clears throat> Ho, the car emancipation rides majestic through our nation, bearing on its train the story, liberty, a nation's glory. Roll it along, roll it along. Roll it along through the nation, freedom's car, emancipation. Roll it along, roll it along. Roll it along through the nation, freedom's car, emancipation. Politicians gazed astounded when at first a bell resounded. Freight trains come and tell these foxes with your votes and ballot boxes. Jump for your lives, 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 jump for your lives. politicians from your dangerous false positions. Jump Jump for your lives, jump for your lives, jump for your lives, jump for your lives, jump for your lives. Politicians from your dangerous false positions hear the mighty car wheels humming. Now look out, the engine's coming. Church and statesmen hear the thunder. Get off the track or you'll fall under. Get off the track, get off the track, get off the track, get off the track, get off the track. All are singing while the liberty bell is ringing. Get off the track, 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 get off the track. All are singing while the liberty bell is ringing. See the people run to meet us at the depot. Thousands greet us. All take seats with exultation in the car emancipation. Huzzah! Huzzah, 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 emancipation soon will bless our happy nation. Huzzah, 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 huzzah. emancipation soon will bless our happy nation. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. <laughs> well, emancipation did indeed finally come, but not until the number of slaves had doubled to four million and we were in the middle of a great civil war. In 1863, when Mr. Lincoln made his glorious Emancipation Proclamation, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Edna, Mrs. Edna Dean Proctor, I should know her well, she's from my own state of New Hampshire. And she was so inspired that she wanted to celebrate that occasion with some special verses. Now, I know you all know John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. I'm sure you do. Well, she wrote some verses in honor of Mr. Lincoln and also uh, John Brown, the great martyred abolitionist. And I'm going to close with just one verse of hers. And I... Uh, I thank you very much for listening, and I hope that we shall meet again. Here is, here is Mrs. Proctor's verse. John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. Bright o'er the sod, let his starry banner wave. Lo, for the millions he periled all to save. Freedom reigns today. And I know you all know the chorus. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Freedom reigns today. Ever want to peek into the past to discover turns of events and surprising insights that can give you the feel of another time? 
There were a few ladies who defied expectations. Kate Carney went looking for such a woman and found Juliet Lowe, who founded America's Girl Scouts. Mrs. Lowe grew from rebel tomboy into a Savannah lady, wife of a rich Englishman and international socialite. At 50, she wanted more meaning in her life, and she discovered scouting, challenging girls to do things no one thought they could do. She found her life's purpose. It's 1920. Mrs. Lowe shares how, in helping girls to find their talents, she uncovered her own. My friends call me Daisy. My older sister calls me crazy. <laughs> well, you see, I. I will admit that I have gone through a number of phases in my life, and I did not discover scouting until I was in my middle age. So my family thought that it was just another one of my phases, so they called it girl scooting. <laughs> well, little did they know how serious I was and how much I wanted more meaning in my life, and little did I know that this, at scouting, would revolutionize my life. I started with a few girls in Savannah, Georgia in 1912, and all of them wanted to be more physically fit and to play sports, which was fine, but their parents didn't want them to do anything physical for fear of their becoming tomboys. Now, I have faced this issue myself previously. So I called a parents meeting and I said, you may not know this, but I was a tomboy myself as a child and I think you should know that I am living proof that a tomboy can grow into a respectable, deaf, older lady. So you see, what is the harm in some girls taking a hike? There was no response. Well, or in helping elders to cross the street. Aha, or in playing basketball. Basketball, they said. Basketball, you cannot play, have our girls playing basketball. They'd have to wear bloomers. That's unladylike. Someone would see their legs. And I thought, hmm, we will have to get, I know, we will build a fence around our our entire playing field, and then I will have some kind of canvas curtains mounted to hang all the way around. So now when the Girl Scouts of Savannah want to go to play basketball, they change into their midi blouses and pumpkin-shaped black bloomers at headquarters. They scoot across the street. Oh, but first they button up their long black cotton coats that I had made them, them all the way to the floor. And then they scoot across the street, they pull the curtains closed all the way around the, the field, and then they take off their coats and they play basketball to their heart's content. And their black stocking legs are safe from the eyes of passers-by and their reputations are unsullied. <laughs> Oh, you see, there are so many reasons why I love scouting. But I think chief among them is my family's wilderness heritage because my great-grandmother, you may not know this, she was captured by a group of Seneca Indians and she lived with them as a captive for four years. And I love helping people. Of course, I do not love chairing national board meetings. I find that long discussions bore me. And there was this once this endless discussion going on about what are the right shoes for all of the scouts. And shopping myself one day, I found the perfect pair. And so I bought cases and cases of them, and I bought a pair for myself. And at the next national board meeting, the ladies wanted to know what the shoes looked like, and so I stood and tucked my skirt between my legs and then stood on my head to show them. 
you'll be glad to know the ladies approved. Well, now, you mustn't get the idea that I'm trying to say that I don't make mistakes. For example, I was one of Savannah's first lady drivers. Now, driving an automobile requires coordination and concentration. And one time, as I was attempting a right turn, I accidentally put my foot on the accelerator rather than the brake, and that caused my car to charge forward into the wall of a house. And there I sat face to face with a family having lunch. And I backed out and I drove along until I came to my brother's, came to a telephone where I could call my brother who was a lawyer and he said, what did you say to them? And I said, I didn't say anything. I had already interrupted their lunch. It didn't seem polite. So you see, what I try to do when I make mistakes is take a lesson from them. And that lesson has to do with minding your manners, admitting your mistake, and carrying on as best you can. I thank you so much for your kind attention. I will be happy to keep talking because, you know, that's what I do because I'm deaf. And when I try and try so hard to listen to conversation, it's a real problem because, well, it's, most conversations are rather boring anyway. So what I do now is I just keep talking until everyone else is quiet and I can kind of tell what is always going on that way. And I look forward to having some more conversations with you.